Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we are here again. We receive much help. We depend on you for the entrance of your word. Give it light and understanding to the simple. We ask for much light. We ask, O oh God, that in this matter of the craft of priesthood, you will continue to educate us and enlighten us from your scriptures so that by your mercy we can be more functional, more fruitful, more effective tools in your hand for the establishment of your kingdom. The passage says, And saviors shall ascend upon Mount Zion, and shall rebuke the Mount of Edom, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. So there is a correlation between the ascendance, the rising up, the emergence, the maturing of saviors upon Mount Zion to rebuke the Mount of Edom so that the kingdom shall be established. Let your mercy be made available to us to use this lecture series to bring about a maturing that we might indeed ascend as saviors upon Mount Zion. Mandelahas uvrehes in the hishka libron de kapaya tahashke we receive much help, O Father. Hallowed be your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are welcome again to yet another lecture in this series, this course, The Craft of Priesthood. Um, by God's grace, this would be the third lecture and, you know, perhaps the final in the intro section before we begin to go into the particulars of the course. Hitherto, we have yet been establishing the burden and we trust that the Lord has established it thus far. Um, in the last lecture, part of the main emphasis the Lord helped us to strike was bringing an awareness to the community that every believer has been brought into. So when you became born again, you have come. Paul will say you are no longer a stranger or a foreigner. And Hebrews will say we have come to Mount Zion, to the city. We are members of the city of the living God. And there we have an innumerable company of angels. So angels are now part of our community. And part of the things we looked at is it is key for every believer who would have a good handle of their craft in priesthood to understand the provision of an innumerable company of angels. That is because that's the same kind of enlightenment that Elisha needed in order to function in a double portion anointing. He said, give me the double portion of what is upon you. That was his request to Elijah. He said, well, only God can do that, but I will know you have it if you receive a revelation of how I go. He says, if you see me go, then you will have it. But what that means is, if you see, if, you are, if it is revealed to you, the means, the mechanism, the framework with which I go, then you will understand the back end. It's like a software program, there's front end or back end. Or even a restaurant, you have the front end and then you have the back end, the kitchen. The back end is really where the work is done. So if you see the back end, the spiritual angle of the advantage made available to the nation of Israel, then you will be able to function in a double portion anointing. And so he saw, other people just saw Elijah go. He did not just see Elijah going. He saw the chariots of fire ridden by angels that came to carry him. And so he's like, oh my God, the chariots of Israel. Meaning, so Israel has spiritual chariots beyond a physical army. And he was able to deploy that when the Syrian army came after him. Physically, he's just one man. But because he had had a revelation, he knew he was not alone. So he asked the Lord to open the eyes of the servant. And once his eye was open, the whole mountain was full of chariots. They've always been there. But it takes a person who stands, who knows his craft, 
who is able to appreciate the realities that he has been brought into to engage these provisions effectively for the establishment of the kingdom of God in the lives of individuals, families, communities, and the world at large. So these were things in the old covenant, how much more the new covenant. So the Hebrews passage, which was the main passage we looked at last time, part of the things we saw there is, it says, you have come unto where Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, unto the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Um, I think I've misquoted it, but we get the idea. No, no, I'm correct. Um, Unto an innumerable company of angels, unto the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, um, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, to God, the judge of all, to the blood of the sprinkling that speaketh better things than what? Than the blood of Abel. So we looked at these things. We understood. We looked at how everybody who comes on board Every born-again believer is brought into this community and should understand the provisions of this community. And in this community, we operate according to the new covenant established by the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the mediator. And everybody should understand that our God is the judge of all. So those others have other gods they are working with, which are fallen angels that rebelled against God. We will look into those things later on. But what is key is that regardless of the name of the God, wherever they are, our God, Jehovah, is the judge of all. This is unto, how do you call it? This is an unto God, the judge of all. The judge is all humans, all spirits, whether their names are Zeus, whether their name is Samadioha, whether doesn't matter what their name is from whatever tribe. Our God is the judge of all. So once we see that, then it does not matter the packaging. It does not matter how opposition brands itself. Once you know that, I may not have heard of you before, but my God is the judge of all. So scripture will say, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Or the Lord Jesus will say, all power in heaven and in earth is given to me. Therefore, you go. Meaning when you go, you will never encounter a scenario where there is a power greater than me. So go. So this is a foundational understanding that every believer that has come into this city of God, this community of God, should understand so that we can function effectively as what a royal priesthood that God has ordained us to be. Now, why did we look into these things? Why did we go to Hebrews in the last um, lecture? Part of the things is we wanted to understand Obadiah, and we will do more of that in this lecture. Obadiah chapter 1, verse 21. It says, And saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. And from what the Lord helped us to look at, we saw from Hebrews chapter 12 that Esau became a symbol for what? Profanity. In verse 16 of Hebrews 12, he said, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one mosel of meat sold his what? Bet right. So Esau, there is a physical Esau. But then this passage is speaking of Esau as a representation of godlessness, of profanity. And we established this in the last lecture, so we wouldn't be going into that. Now that we've understood that Esau is a representation of godlessness, and then we have seen also, it says, we, on the other hand, believers, have come to Mount Zion. So Mount Zion then, in contrast, is representative of what? The city of the living God, the general assembly and church of the firstborn in its finest estate. The heavenly what? 
Jerusalem. That's what Hebrews 12, 22 is telling us. Once you are able to understand that, believing that we have been following through from the last lecture to this point, once you're able to understand that, then this passage is telling us of a great um, conquest, a great um, showdown that is set to occur when he says, and Savior shall come up. That coming up speaks of a maturing. So if Hebrews is telling us that Mount Zion is a place of an innumerable company of angels and the city of the living God, is telling us that this is the general assembly. Then when he says, Savior shall come up on Mount Zion, then it's telling you that the process of coming up is a maturing, is an ascendance. And God wants us, his people, to mature. In John, Revelation, sorry, Revelation chapter 4, after showing him many things, he says, John heard a voice from heaven saying, come up hither. So that call to come up hither, um, implies a maturing, an elevation in your walk with God. An elevation in the stature of your Christian life. So, when it says, Savior shall come up on Mount Zion, it's saying, in the community of believers, a people shall emerge. A people shall mature. A people shall do what? Advance. A people shall what? Advance. The people shall increase in, 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 the, in the, the, the characteristics that define their, their category. And this category is what? The city of the living God. The city of Jesus Christ. So what will we say um, that means? Or how do we digest this? Or what's the comparison um, when we say um, the Mount of Esau? So the Mount of Esau, as we see in this previous, in, in Hebrews 12, Esau represents the profane. Esau represents the ungodly. And what does the passage say? Just like he sold his birthright. In the last lecture, we said that represents a people who refuse to retain God in their heart and so have been given over to a what? Reprobate mind. A reprobate mind. So in the camp of darkness, backed with demons, people will mature, mature in darkness, mature in partnership with demons. So the sons of God have to mature in the advantage that is afforded to the community the spiritual community of Zion. Now, why is this important? Why is this key? Or why, why does this passage symbolically make reference um, to the Mount of what Esau? Why does it do that? So why does it make that link in the passage, Obadiah 1.21? Savior shall come upon Mount Zion, and they will do what? rebuke the Mount of Edom. We have looked at already from Hebrews and to say Esau represents the ungodly. But there is an extra way we can look um, to appreciate it if we... There's an extra way we can look to appreciate it. Um, though before we do that, if we look at Second Timothy, just establishing some points here. Second Timothy chapter three. So Second Timothy chapter three from verse From verse 1, it says, This know also that in the last days, which is where we find ourselves, and part of the burden for this course is to prepare sufficiently. 
that in the last days, perilous times shall what come? And they are already upon us. Really strange things are happening. Strange things. Things that used to be in the secret are now made open. Even witchcraft is now more public, embedded into children's cartoons, embedded into different things. So the enemy is bolder now. For men, verse 2, shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. So all these characteristics are things we can use to refer to ungodliness. So the mount of Esau or the category of Esau will be characterized by all these. It says, verse 6, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. It says, Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. It says, But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. So what we came to look at here is to just another scripture that speaks of the perilous times and the season, the era of things. And in verse 8, he says, As Janus and Jambres withstood Moses. These are those who thought themselves to be magicians in Egypt and sought to display power. Moses came as a priest of God. Having encountered God, been taught of God, he went. And what did he do? He displayed the power of God. His rod turned into a serpent, into a snake. And they was of... Wow. They thought that they are magicians. So in that context, Moses had mature. He came up upon Mount Zion as a savior. Allegorically speaking, he is like a representation of maturity. And the, ex the opposition he faced is like a case study with which to appreciate that which is already happening and will yet happen in greater measure. Imagine Moses went ordinarily or has the advantage of God but have not understood how to function in it. And he got there and realized that he's not just speaking plain English with these people. These, come, uh, these guys are coming back to it, occult powers and pff, release their display, their power. And they turn their rods to snakes also. Imagine Moses did not know what to do or how to deal with such a scenario. That would have been unfortunate. But because he had been taught, which is what we are supposed to be taught, and we trust the Lord to help us in this lecture series, to be a teaching so that we know and understand our heritage and how to function in it. So that even if Janice and Jambres, symbolically speaking, or the ungodly in league with demons and occult provisions come against us or serve as an opposition to the establishment of the kingdom, there is sufficient grace to, 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 to prevail by the power of God. It could be manifest in your personal life your relationships, your marriage, your household, your family, your, your, your church, your community. There are different contexts, areas where oppositions are made manifest and we practice all the way to the establishing of the kingdom of God in the lives of people, deposing 
the enemy and installing Jesus Christ, the flag of Jesus Christ. So this passage, that's one of the things we came to pick that as Genesis and Jambra is opposed, so also there is and shall be an opposition. But what is interesting in this passage that we came to pick, we have spoken of Esau in the symbolic reference. But now, why Esau? Esau represents ungodliness. But there's more to this discussion. Now, what do we know about Esau? If you've been a Bible student or you've been reading your Bible, you will know that Esau is a name that shows up in the... Um, in the Old Testament, the, right around Genesis 25, we would see if we read, need to read it or not. But it's a popular story that most of us are probably familiar with. We know that Isaac got married to who? Rebecca. And they had twins, which is the one of the, the first recorded or verifiable record of twins in scripture. Genesis 25, the first verifiable reference to scripture. So it says Abraham, Genesis 25 verse 19 to 34. Abraham he got married to um, Rebe sorry Isaac got married to Rebecca he got married to Rebecca and in the course of time they conceived and first of all she was barren and then she conceived and she brought forth she had twins in her womb. Now, one of the ways you interact with scripture is, is God, the Old Testament is records of actual history. But God walked in the midst of that history to tell stories, especially prophetic stories that he would use as allegories to explain New Testament realities especially the lives of the people documented in scriptures, where he, hand, he had a hand in affecting the course of their lives. That means, by means of exhortation, that if you allow the Lord to personally have a hand in the dictates of your life, then he will inevitably use your life to tell a story. It may not be written down like this, but he might remind somebody or some persons about experiences that you had and use that to encourage them. Both what the experience is and how you went through it. So that's a learning we can pick in terms of allowing the Lord tell a story through our lives. So with that in mind, we know that the, the things that happened here, for example, this Isaac, Rebecca, and their twin scenario is not just happenstance. It's not just per chance. It's not just, you know, it just so happened. It didn't just so happen. God took advantage of the scenario to communicate something interesting that we would appreciate. Isaac, Rebecca, she was barren. They prayed to the Lord and she conceived of twins. And there was a struggle in the womb. A struggle in the womb. A struggle. Ultimately, they were born. And one's name, the first name was called what? Esau. And the second one was called Jacob. Now, it is in this passage that Hebrews 12, which we read earlier, was quoting when he says, Esau was profane for a mosel of meat, of bread, of food. He sold his birthright. It was in this passage um, um, that's from Genesis 25-29 it says and Jacob sought pottage and Esau came from the field and he was faint and Esau said to Jacob feed me I pray thee 
with that same red pottage for I am faint therefore his name was called what Edom and Jacob said sell me this day thy birthright and Esau said behold I am at the point to die what profit shall this birthright do to me um, and Jacob said swear to me this day and he swore to him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage and lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. In his mind, he probably is thinking that Jacob is foolish. What is birthright? Does not mean anything. I can say whatever I want. When it's time for the blessing, I will still receive my birthright. So sure. Like jokes on you, I'll collect the food and I'll still have my bed right. So he thought, but God was watching, and so when he swore, he had no respect for the spiritual realm to know that what he's saying is consequential. And so, scripture says he despised heaven, saw it as he despised his bed right. So, as a point of exhortation. Regardless of the situation you are going through, be careful what you say. Be careful the posture of heart you maintain because you are being evaluated. The Bible says the ways of a man are before the Lord and he ponders, he is going, he meditates, he weighs thoughts and intents to see where you fall. Do you value him, value the things of God or do you despise it? Regardless of what your outward show looks like, he can judge the actual texture of your heart. But that's an exhortation. What do we come to look at here? There is something interesting about the story of Esau and Jacob. And one of the interesting things here is the fact that they are twins. Like we said, God is the one writing his story. So in the story God is writing, why did God include twins? What is the message behind twins? So here we have twins, and these twins are interesting. In Genesis 25, verse 23, from verse 22, it says, And the children, while they were in the womb, struggled together within her. There is a struggle. There is New Testament references that would explain that, um, you know, that struggle, but we don't want to jump the gun. And she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, two nations, are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all over like an hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And then it says, and the boys grew. So, in the stories that God tells, prophetic stories, using people's actual experiences, there are interplays. Not every single detail, but in positions of prophetic information in their actual experience. So, in the actual experience here, part of the injection or imposition of prophetic information is these twins, the mystery of the twinery, the twinery, if we should call it. God was unveiling something marvelous, albeit hidden, in this information the story he's telling he pre brought twins into the picture and then he says these twins one shall be stronger than the other 
And in case you are wondering which shall be stronger than which, it says the elder shall serve the younger. Meaning the one that came out first will serve the younger, the second one. So then, what is God saying? What manner of prophetic information is imposed in this experience of Isaac and Rebekah? The information is that God was actually exposing that in the womb of creation, in the womb of the birthing, of the genesis of humankind, exists what? Two realities. Two manner of people. Two nations. Prophetic what? Twins. So, imagine the scenario where they are twins. Maybe nobody knows that they are twins. And then the woman is in labor and she pushes, oof, and one came out. Wow. Then they think that, okay, the next contraction is just for the placenta to come out. And so they tarry there, they are with one, they have that experience for a couple seconds and say, oh, I have another contraction. Okay, okay, okay. And, ah, here is another one. There are two. So also is the story of humanity. We are taking our time to introduce it. And what are we introducing? The fact that God interposed prophetic information in Rebecca's experience to pass across. And there are many of such injection of prophetic information in the Old Testament. It is hidden in the record of actual experiences because they were actual experiences people had. Abraham's experience in Isaac, he did not know that it is pointing somehow to Jesus. All those kind of transactions in different places in scripture, Noah's experience and many more. The experience of the Israelites, they are busy dealing with Passover lamb. They don't know it's actually pointing to Jesus. Those kind of things. But here we see another one. God is revealing that actually there are twins or there is a mystery of twins in the womb of creation. So what does this mean that there are a mystery of twins in the womb of creation? Imagine the story of humanity and the birthing forth, the creation of man. The mystery in the twin reality. What are twins? Especially identical twins. They speak of two parallel realities conceived at the same time, unleashed at different times in succession, one and then the other. So what is the twins? What are the twins that scripture is that the Lord was pointing to? We will go to this passage in the New Testament as we begin to introduce that. And that will be in First Corinthians. This is another important information that if you understand, it helps you in your craft as a priest. Because you understand the back end of reality and what you are actually dealing with, what you are proposing, what you are introducing to the lives of men. So come with me to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45. 
It says, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, and the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not first which was spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy, and the second man is the Lord from heaven. And as is the earth, such are they that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And then it moves on and on, which we can look at um, at another time. But what did we come to pick in this passage? And we bless God for Paul, who is one of the few or only that speaks of Jesus Christ in this manner. He says, now we know Adam. But what we did not know, that Adam is actually one of two Adams. Yes. For some of you listening, you may never, you may have read this passage, you may not have read this passage, but it may not have dawned on you in your consciousness that there are actually two Adams. The one we say, ah, Adam, Adam, Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve, Genesis, Adam. That Adam is actually one of two Adams. The first of the Adam twins. Yes. So there is what we can call the Adam twins. Allegorically speaking. Though prophetic actuality. So this passage is saying that the first Adam, the one we know as Adam, Adam and Eve is the first Adam. What is he? A living soul. The last one, who, which is Jesus, is a life-giving spirit. So just like we're looking at Esau and Jacob, twins, but they have different characteristics. So that was an imposition of information hidden in the experience of Rebecca. Pointing and giving a clue to the fact that A, what you have known or what humanity has known hitherto, this is even before Jesus was revealed physically, what you have known hitherto as humanity is actually, you are just interacting with the first of the two Adams. In due time, the last Adam will be introduced. It says the first Adam 47, verse 47, 1 Corinthians 15, is of the earth, earthy. While the second man, the first man, the second man, is the Lord from heaven. Chew on that, that there are two Adams. The first Adam, the last Adam. It's called the last Adam because there will never be another Adam. What is an Adam? Or who is an Adam? So imagine he calls him first Adam, last Adam, first man, second man. He does not reckon all the in-between. Because these are the only two that have ever been without sin. Adam, when he was created, without sin. Jesus, when he was introduced into the world, without sin. But an Adam... It's not just a without sin uh, scenario. And Adam, by definition, is the genesis, the beginning of the human genealogy. Adam is the father of the human genealogy. So the first Adam is the father of all human beings that we have ever that are upon the earth or have ever lived or will ever live. So that means for, you know, comparison's sake, there are about 7 or so billion people upon the earth right now, or 8 billion. If we sum up all the people who have lived and died, plus the ones who are currently alive, plus the ones that will yet be unborn, maybe we can say it will come up to, you know, mm, let's give it 
16 billion. 16 billion people. Let's round it up for ease. 20 billion people is the scope of humanity. Adam, the definition of an Adam, Adam, as at the time when he was in Genesis, deciding whether or not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, all 20 billion people were in him. But they begin to be manifest as he begin to reproduce, 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 reproduce. But all of us, physically speaking, came from Adam. Now, Jesus being called an Adam means that he also is the beginning of the human genealogy, but a different human genealogy. So there is, as shown in verse 47 of this first Corinthians passage, the first one is Ephi, natural. The second is the Lord from heaven. So the message in this prophetic twin information here is that these two shall war with themselves. And what does that mean? What does that mean? We have seen how it has played out. The first was introduced and similar to Esau, he actually sold the spiritual heritage he was supposed to get. He despised it. The blessing did not mean anything to him. Betrayed seemed like, you know, fables, superstition. That's referring to Esau. Likewise, Adam. The Bible says Adam was not deceived. He saw his wife has eaten it. He knew what is right. And so he was not deceived. He knew he's not supposed to eat it. He could probably discern that something has happened to his wife after she has eaten it. But he chose to eat it still. To just follow along. So it was a willful refusal to go the way of God. And because Satan was the author of that rebellion, Romans 6 will tell us that, do you not know that whosoever you yield yourself servant to obey, his servant you are, Romans 6, 16. And so by yielding to Satan's instruction to eat the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it was not just a self-propelled rebellion. It was a rebellion born out of obeying an instruction and as such, Spiritual transactions imply that he becomes a servant to the one that gave the instruction. And that's how humanity became servants to sin, to Satan. But Satan's name in Genesis chapter 4, God called him, when talking to Cain, God calls Satan um, sin. You say, why is your countenance down? Um, if you do well, don't you know you will be accepted? Yes, Genesis 4, verse 7. As if thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and his desire is to have you, but you are to rule over him. That's the ideal scenario. So sin is referred to as what? Him. It's a person. And that person is Satan. So John 6 or 7 verse 38, we say, He that committed sin is the servant of sin. So commit sin. That sin there is the action. But servant of sin, that sin now is the person. So sin is, can be used as a verb referring to the action or as a person referring to the sponsor, the promoter of the rebellion. Amen. So Adam yielded. How are we doing with time? 
Okay. Adam yielded to Satan and became his servant. And after he became his servant, then Satan could now introduce sin into the life of Adam and then we see rebellion and all manner of evil happening. So what was being shown there, that prophetic imposition of that prophetic message imposed into Rebecca's experience, God was saying that, yes, the first has come, referring to Adam, and he has despised the things of God. Yes. And sin and rebellion and death and decay has found expression. Yes. But there is another, and that another is actually the greater, because that one that looks like the first will actually serve the younger, the second. So in the language of 1 Corinthians 15, the first Adam and his genealogy will serve the last Adam. The first man will serve the, la the second man. Or Adam, as we know it in Genesis, will serve Jesus Christ. Now, why is this important and interesting? If you get this, and the Lord help us to establish this, the Adam and Adam is a is a miracle. In Genesis, we see that God created tree and fruit and the seed. You know, bearing fruit after its kind, the seed in itself. So every tree already had its seed in itself, and that was the pattern. They would just continue to produce like that. So God created everybody, all 20 billion human beings, God created them in Adam. So physically, we know that reproduction, the body of the child, is in the loins of the parents, as sperm, as egg, and all that kind of things. So God had established all 20 billion people in Adam. So if Jesus, think about this, think about this. If Jesus, if Jesus, and because Jesus, not just if, we say if for argument's sake, if he is an Adam, which Adam he actually is, then it means that God has created all 20 billion people again in him. It is on this side of time that we see it as, oh, God has now recreated us or recreated humanity. Like we said, because Jesus is an Adam, if we say there are 20 billion people in Adam, the first Adam, then Jesus being an Adam of no lesser Adam status means that included in him are all 20 billion people. Chew on this as we proceed. It is on this side. Now, how does one come into his first Adam reality? Adam Earth of the tree of knowledge of good and evil many thousands of years ago and became bondage. He sold himself and his generation, which all humanity is part of, into servitude and slavery to sin. That's why everybody is dealing with the sin nature. But it is when a person is born that they come into the experience of that spiritual transaction. Likewise, it is when a person is born again that they come into the reality, the experience of the spiritual transactions in Christ Jesus, the last Adam or the second man. So now in our lens, we can see oh, Jesus came 2,000 years ago and God has through him, giving us a new lease of life. But what that Rebecca's experience is telling us is that God actually was, high, was putting, you know, deep truth in there and giving us a clue. You have to wonder, 
how did the apostles, you know, and, you know, understand some of the things they understood? They wrote the New Testament by studying the Old. So that means the Lord opened their eyes to things. Point being, their truths God has hidden in the Old Testament. And so, whereas it was not obvious, God was actually revealing by Rebecca's experience that there are actually two Adams. The Adam, Adam, the Adam estate, the Adam title is not a singular, it's a twin reality. Humanity is familiar with the first, which is earthy, but soon will be unveiled the second, which is heavenly. And the first, which is earthy, would serve the younger. Now, we, the gospel is preached to us, to humanity. And when a person believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, they subscribe by the born-again experience, they shut down their profile, if you will, in the first Adam genealogy, and their profile is activated in the last Adam reality, in Jesus. Once that switch is made, then as many, that should say Christians or believers, as many as become born again in Christ Jesus are now part of what? The Jesus genealogy, the genealogy of the last Adam. Why is this important? It is so that when he says, Savior shall come up on Mount Zion to rebuke the mouth of Esau. If you think of Zion, trace it back. Zion is the capital, is, you know, in Israel, the city of David. But who are these people? Who is Israel? Israel is the name given to Jacob. Is an imposition of Jesus' name. Jesus is actually the real Israel. If you look at the title, the meaning, Israel means one who has power with God, a prince who is like God and has prevailed. There is no other person that can be said to be like God and is a prince and has prevailed with God. That is Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was with God. The same was in the beginning with God. So, Jesus, the Son of God, by the twin mystery, it's really profound. By the twin mystery, Jesus is ordained to actually have preeminence, even in the physical. To be the real prevailing Adam. So, what that means is that, and this is why the gospel is sweet. It's not an invitation. That means that regardless of how deep and dirty and decadent anybody might have gone in, in the world, understanding this is a glimmer of hope. It's a glimmer of hope and joy. And what is it? That almost as it were, as an insurance policy, God has ordained by this mysterious twin reality, that when he was creating these 20 billion people and putting them in Adam, he actually did a twin creation. Now, we in the US, there are something we call the twin towers. There are two towers that look alike. So, humanity is a twin creation. Hitherto, we have known the first. It says that which is spiritual in 1 Corinthians did not come first, but that which is physical, that which is earthy. So what humanity has known as its reality is only but the first. Jesus came to unveil what? The second. So everybody upon the earth, all 20 billion people, the ones that have lived, the ones that are currently alive, the ones that have yet be born, have twin realities. One reality is in the first Adam, the second reality is in the last Adam. Meaning, whereas somebody might be thinking, I have done so many bad things, I've done so many horrible things, my life has been messed up, I have gotten myself into so many dark things. Yes, that is true in your first reality. 
but there is another reality in Jesus that is completely brand new. So Bible will say, if any man is in Christ, he is what? A brand new creature. That creature, for all you care, has been preordained as a twin reality in God. One was released ahead and chose corruption and befell all humanity. Then in due time, the other came forth and chose righteousness. So that that which came first will serve the one that came second. How does this interplay with Obadiah? We who have become born again and are born again in Christ Jesus are now part of the family of what? Jesus. We have identified ourselves in this second reality. While the ungodly who have followed the pattern of Esau are what still in the first reality so that prophecy in genesis 25 kicks in that two nations adam's genealogy jesus genealogy two categories of humanity those that are still in the first adam those that are now in the last adam but it says one shall be stronger than the other the one that came first will serve the younger. That means those who are in the first Adam reality, by definition, will be subservient to those who are in the last Adam reality. Now, what does subservient mean? It means that at this junction of context, it is ordained that those in the last Adam reality, the children of God, born again believers in Christ Jesus, will what prevail what does prevail look like it simply means the gospel is going to continue to be propounded prevailing relative to the adams means that the new adam will conquer the first adam and there will be a great reclaiming of souls out of the first Adam reality into the new real, into the last Adam reality. But this is enhanced as people who are already in the last Adam reality mature as saviors. And that maturity, part of the burden of that maturity is having a good handle of the craft of priesthood. Once you understand truth and the treasures and the realities preordained, then you can more effectively your life can be more effectively um, communicate the fulfillment of that prophecy as you take your place in the last Adam to do what? Prevail over the first. To establish the kingdom in the lives of those who have not yet become born again. Because by prophetic definition, those in the last Adam are stronger. So it doesn't matter if they are allied with demons, with darkness. It doesn't matter how so-called high-ranking they are. Those are called the mountain, the kingdom, the category of Esau versus the category of Jesus. But that Esau will serve Jesus according to the Genesis 25 prophecy of Esau and Jacob. And how that twins is actually prophetically pointing to the first Adam and what? The last Adam. I'm really trusting God that this has become clear. On a personal exhortative note for yourself and for those you can communicate with, especially those who are not yet born again, it is beautiful to know that God created you in a twin formation. God created humanity as a twin reality. There's twin, twin towers, there's twin Adams, there's twin humanity. So everybody has a twin identity. This is particularly interesting for somebody who has not yet given his life to Christ and is thinking, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I will rise and fall. It's not about you. There is actually another creation of you that does not have any of this history. Was never corrupted is actually preserved in the last Adam. 
there is a new Adam. The very fact that there is another Adam should be a, a joy. Humanity should know that I have a redefinition. That redefinition has always been. It's not just introduced now. It has always been. It's a similar thing actually with Cain and Abel. Though they are not exactly twins. But I guess the, the gap in Cain and Abel also prophesies of the gap in timeline from when Adam was unveiled in Genesis to when Jesus was unveiled in the, in the New Testament about 2,000 years ago. In fact, it's because the enemy thought that Abel was the promised seed that will bruise the head of the serpent. That's part of the reason why the enemy orchestrated his killing. So that is why the Bible will say the blood of Jesus speaketh better things than the blood of Abel because Abel is a pointer of some sort to Jesus Christ. And our prayer is that the Lord will indeed cause our eyes to comprehend these things, this, this dual reality as we begin to take our place in Jesus Christ and mount up in maturity to go forth and subdue Edom. How do we subdue Edom? Paul will say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus. It is the power of God unto salvation. To establish the kingdom in the lives of men. In our lives, in our context, in our families, in the nation, in the community. But the Lord will perfect our understanding in these things. As we advance, as we proceed to the praise of the glory of his grace. Kindly leave a comment if you have any questions and uh, the Lord will grant us grace to chew on these things, interact with it and um, um, shed more light for greater equipping um, as we go through continually in this course. Um, you would do well. It would be very awesome, great and encouraging if you could like this video and subscribe and share it with your, your friends, your family. Um, in that way, do your part in spreading the, the word of God for the equipping of the Lord's people so that many, 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 many more of us can ascend as saviors upon Mount Zion so that what? The kingdom shall be the Lord's. In Jesus' name, amen.